Concerning Open Gaming License 1.1, deauthorization of Open Gaming License 1.0, and demand for a more definitive statement. To whom it may concern, I represent Sad Fish Games, LLC, and Prudence Holdings, LLC, DBA, Prudence Publishing, two U.S.-based publishers of the tabletop gaming materials. I've tried to reach out under more cordial terms via phone and ordinary Witches of the Coast customer service support channels, but I've not received any response or have been declined communication with the appropriate staff. On December 2021, Wizards of the Coast put out an announcement indicating a new version of the open gaming license would be released. The statement was brief, vague, and as I'm sure you know, caused quite a bit of disruption in the broader gaming community. Notably, however, the language suggested an intention to effectively repudiate the 1.0 ver a version of the license, presumably in an effort to compel publishers to make use of the new 1.1 license. While Wizards of the Coast has been silent since December 21, 2022, you are likely aware of various alleged leaks of draft language from the proposed 1.1 license, some of which appear to be an attempt by Wizards of the Coast to repudiate and restrict the use of the 1.0 license, as well as to compare the shelling of selling, sharing of financial data with Wizards of the Coast and potentially pay a royalty share to the, open to the company for use of open gaming content. Section 4 of the 1.0a open gaming license grants for contributors grants from contributors to include Wizards of the Coast and everyone who has used the license since, a perpetual, perpetual worldwide, royalty-free, non-exclusive license with the exact terms of the license to use, the open game content. It is quite clear from this language that the license cannot be revoked, nor can Wizards of the Coast stop its future use. So this seems to be counter. So it seemed like the uh, our friend lawyer okay, was talking about, well, uh, maybe. So this is going the other way. So th th this is good that we've got the counter here. This is what I'm talking about, the different arguments here. So this, this seems to be the counter. So this person says it's quite clear from this language that the license cannot be revoked, nor can Wizards of the Coast stop its future use. All right, hang on. I got to go to another one. Um, another. These are individual JPEGs. So let me go to this. Stop. Oh, what? Nope. Continuing on here, it says... Section 9 authorizes wizards to publish updated versions of the license. Section 9 authorizes wizards to publish updated versions of the license, but also grants permission to use any authorized version of the license to copy, modify, or distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Let's um let me grab what's a like Midgard would have this, right? Let's go the Kobold Press. Or actually, no, this should, this should. Where can I, where can I find? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it is. It is right here in the back. So this is referring to Section 9. Section 9 specifically says updating the license. So this is the whole Section 9 here, updating the license. Wizards or its... Uh, Wizards or its designated agents may publish updated versions of this license. You may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Well, see, that right to me, oh, I meant to put this up on screen. So that's what we're looking at. So that, but that's the uh, section nine. So that's why I guess that language deauthorize is so important because like I would consider what is an authorized version of the license? Like I, in my mundane understanding of that would be an, a license that is officially published and released by wizards. That's an authorized version of the license, not a leak, not a draft, you know, nothing like that, but that an authorized version of the license is one that is, you know, complete and released, you know, publicly by wizards of the coast. That's an authorized version. The, language here then says, well, can you deauthorize? Can you deauthorize a license and in what circumstances? I, I would say there's nothing about deauthorizing a license because we've got several different terms. We've got perpetual, we've got we've got perpetual, we've got revocability, but then also the third thing to think about is this authorization. So there are three different levels to this. Or three I don't know if there are levels, but three different angles on this. Is it revocable? And is it deauthorizable? So do we have um from a legal perspective, we understand some information about what perpetual means. We we'll probably know a lot of information about what perpetual means. We also know from a legal standpoint what um, revocable and irrevocable means. Do we know from a legal standpoint what 
authorization and deauthorization means, or is that specific to this case? Okay, so we're saying Section 9 authorizes Wizards to publish an updated versions of this license, but also grants permission to use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify, and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. Some leaks suggest Wizards intends to claim that 1.0 license is no longer an authorized version, forcing future contributors to use the 1.1 license. Notably, authorized version is not a defined term in the license. Which, right, so that's exactly why I'm saying my interpretation would be of that. But what does it mean to be an authorized version? And what exactly, I gave my opinion, but what is it, uh, and then is deauthorization possible? Notably, notably, authorized version is not a defined term in the license. As you know, ambiguities and agreements such as these, such as these offer, uh, such as these office, uh, such as these, whenever a distribute, whenever a distribute, a distribute, <laughs> Dispute arises are interpreted against the drafter, the drafter being Wizards of the Coast. Okay, I talked about that a moment ago, right? So that's why I would say I'm confused about what an authorized version is. Um, we have our understanding that's been used for the past two decades. I'm understanding an authorized version being one that's actually officially published and released by Wizards of the Coast. Then it's authorized. Like I said, it's not a draft, it's not a leak, but an officially published version. And if we're and if the concern here is what that means, it should be interpreted against the drafter. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Even read charitably, Section 9 clearly does not empower wizards to compel others to use only a new version. Quite the opposite. It appears to empower the contributors to use either version if desired. Section 13 sets forth the sole condition of termination of the license, namely a failure to cure any breach of its terms within 30 days of notice of a breach thereto. Outside of what is given, Wizards has no authority to terminate the license, both with respect to prior published content and future published content under the license. Okay, let me look that up. Section 13. Section 13 is termination. This license will terminate automatically if you fail to comply with all terms herein and fail to cure such breach within 30 days of becoming aware of the breach. All sub-licenses shall survive the termination of this license. And that's all it says. All right there. So it's saying that this is the sole condition of termination set forth in the license, a failure to cure a breach in the terms of the license. Outside of what is given, Wizards has no authority to terminate the license, both with respect to prior published content, content and future published content under the license. The above interpretations are supported by case law universally ac across U.S. courts, and I suspect more strongly in European courts. Further, which is the coast conduct over the past 23 years also supports this interpretation. Oh, this Q&A is coming back again. For see, for example, the following taken from Wizards' website in the past through verifiable means. Can't Wizards of the Coast change the license in any way? Yes, it could. Under the license, already defines. However, yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content that's been previously distributed under an earlier version in Section 9. As a result, even if Wizards of the Coast made a change you disagreed with, you could continue to use an earlier acceptable version at your, as your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards of the Coast to ever make a change that the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community would just ignore that change anyway. This appears to be an admission of the correct way to interpret Section 9. Further, it is a statement many have also reasonably relied upon to, the, to their detriment if Wizards has changed their position on Section 9, suggesting Wizards is it stopped from enforcing a contradictory claim. There is, no, there is also now over 22 years of conduct on the part of Wizards that, even if the above interpretation are factually or are, are facially incorrect, appears to have been ratified, appears to have ratified the conduct of publishers at large using the language liberally. Further, applying the doctrine of interpreting, interpreting ambiguities against the drafter, I struggle to see how Wizards could believe a more restrictive interpretation will survive the scrutiny in court. I also have to expect that subpoenaed records and or depositions of the relevant persons that were involved in drafting the 1.0 license, something which will inevitably occur if we or other parties are forced to litigate this matter, will, ex will support notions that the intended interpretations were in line with more liberal interpretations above, not the alleged inter new interpretations Wizards may be trying to support. Perhaps this is all a misunderstanding. I am, so, uh, I am so skeptical of the legal soundness and reputation revocation of the 1.0a that I suspect it may indeed be a misunderstanding. And let's go to the next one. This is like the perfect thing for rules lawyers, right? <laughs> if you're a rules lawyer, this is exactly the kind of stuff you want to get into. Wait a minute. Hold on. There are all kinds of uh, legal stuff going on here uh, about my game. Let's Let's read all these contracts and Rules lawyers, unite. 
Uh, let's see. Window, page three. Let me zoom in and then put this up. Okay, so the misunderstanding that Wizards intends something different, such as the treatment of the 1.1 license as a new iteration entirely, while keeping the 22-year-long tra long tradition of using the 1.0a license intact. However, while Wizards has been silent, aside from the December 21, 2022 announcement, this continued silence in face of speculation and apparent leaks alongside Wizards' community to repudiate said leaks or issue more clear statements suggests Wizards does indeed intend to repudiate the 1.0a license or otherwise seek to breach its terms by trying to restrict its future use. My clients can only interpret this as intent by Wizards to unlawfully breach the license, an action that will inevitably lead to my clients and probably many of the tens of thousands of contributors globally who have used the license since 2002, including Paizo Free League, and other, oh yeah, Free League's in there too. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of Free League stuff. Free League's been crushing it lately. Here on the, we've been looking at their stuff on the streams. Uh, we, I got the Alien RPG over there to look at. Uh, Free League and other major competitors to litigate this matter across the country and indeed across the world. This letter constitutes a demand for a more definitive statement from Wizards regarding their apparent intention to breach the 1.0 gaming license or lack thereof. If no response is received directly by my office within the next 10 days, my client will be forced to prepare preparation for litigation to the fullest extent allowable by law, including contacting major and minor publishers to join in a potential claim against Wizards for anticipatory breach and other claims. That's another way to do it. I mean, this could be something that even if you know we talked about who alone has enough financial resources and incentive to do it, but um, you know, collect uh, getting together as a group could certainly be uh, the case as well. We hadn't talked about that specifically yet, uh, but that would be another way to do it. Even though the collective power of a whole bunch of smaller publishers might not be enough to go against Hasbro as far as finances go, but there might also be lawyers who are willing to do it. There, there are lawyers who are gamers, right? There's, some, there's also a possibility that some lawyers out there, like, I just want to do it. <laughs> I just want to, I just want to take this to, to the court. I am confident this is not in the interest of Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast, as the law seems entirely unambiguous in its favor of the above description, above, above described interpretation of the license, notwithstanding the effect such litigation will surely have on the Wizards of the Coast brand and public perception, perception here too, which we've also been talking about here. It is not my client's intention to become embroiled in a legal dispute over two decade, over two decade old license terms. Quite the contrary, it is their desire to continue publishing and, as they have done for years, collaborate with Wizards to expand the tabletop hobby for the benefit of all publishers and players alike. Where this remains possible depends on Wizards' response here, too. To be entirely clear, if it is the intention of Wizards or Hasbro to repudiate the 1.0 license and bully publishers such, that, such as my clients into accepting less favorable terms under the 1.1 license, creators are not going to be bullied. The courts will ensure this at the end of the day. Should you have any questions, please contact me directly at All of That's Redacted. Okay. So that's the other side. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So DM Toolbox says, so Foundry VTT is not making any statement until OGL 1.1 is released. The only statement they made was from Atropos, owner of Foundry. Uh, and the statement is, we've been actively monitoring this situation, and we're going to be proactively working on a path forward that will cover our use case and allow us to support 1D&D. &D. Uh, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, we are not, however, in a position to do so already under the terms of today's post. This is, there is work to do. I mean, I would expect that to be from everybody. I mean, something like, first of all, this is a leak. We don't know its credibility. We don't know it's going into to action. But publishers have got to be... Publishers of all times and creators of all kinds have got to be looking at different um, potential things that could happen. Because, I mean, you should always be looking at that. Like, okay, if this happens, like looking in advance, that way you're not responding, you know, in panic in a moment. Okay, if this turns out to be the case, what are we going to do? Now, if this turns out to be the case, what are we going to do? I mean, that only seems reasonable. And nobody probably – that takes a lot of time to think about. Thank you, DM Toolbox, for the info. Yes, thank you. DM's Toolbox says, yes. Regarding building Persephone. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, building Persephone says, no one can say anything official until Wizards of the Coast makes an official announcement with the finalized terms of license. Right. We don't know. And DM's Toolbox agrees. Yes, hopefully it does go to court. It only takes one lost court case to say that what they are doing is not legal and saving the entire community. Hopefully so, Building Persephone says. Also, as Grimhild says, thank you for the statement. Building Persephone says, lawyers lay out arguments. 
uh, lawyers' letters lay out arguments, not legal decisions. Right. Yes, it's an argument. That's the argument. We've seen several different arguments here. Right. Exactly. That was not a legal decision by a court. That was the argument that those lawyers are making. Of course. DM's Toolbox says, this is what I mean about all those lawyers saying different things. So far, it's up in the air. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. You can't just go to, oh, let me go to an IP lawyer who's a specialist in this. I mean, because I, I mean, obviously, I mean, I guess you would you would expect that Wizards of the Coast you know, has its own lawyers and they're probably saying, yeah, it's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Offy Matrix. Welcome. Hi. Great to have you on the stream. Great to see you on the channel. Welcome. Coming in from the UK. Great. Great to have you here. Building Persephone says, think of it like a negotiation. You go in hot and try to come out of it with what you hope for in the first place. So I wouldn't necessarily take the letter exactly as written. Yes, got it. Uh, Guitar Guy Nick, I think Chaosium and Call of Cthulhu has the open GL from Wizards of the Coast too. Uh, well, one open Cthulhu, one, I've got both. I've got both versions of uh, that. There's the Call of Cthulhu that's written with the Call of Cthulhu rule system, but there was a Call of Cthulhu that I've got over here. Uh, this one right here is based on third edition, right? So there were both, right? I think we already came up with what we need as far as the license goes. But, uh, yeah, I guess I would expect this would. Anyway, not important. For certain values of authorized. Right, yeah, what exactly does that mean? Uh, DM's Toolbox says, I'm curious as to why Call of Cthulhu is unrelated, right? Oh, that's what I was just saying. So Call of Cthulhu, this one right here. See, this one has the D20 on it. So they're, two, they're different versions. Um, this right here, oh, that's the Keeper's rule book. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu Investigator's Handbook right here. I would expect this one does not because it is its own rule system. This would have nothing to do with the OGL. At least my understanding would be. We got to look at Call of Cthulhu more on the stream anyway. Uh, so that, but that uh, this version, yeah, this version right here would because they made it specifically with third edition rules. It's got the D20 system logo on it. It's got the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. Well, it actually, this one actually has the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. So this is this version of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And then back here, it's got uh, D20 system, Wizards of the Coast, and Chaosium on it. Maybe that's why it doesn't have the license in it, because it's a co-published. It's, I mean, it's actually got the Wizards of the Coast logo on it. I don't actually see that in the back here. That's interesting. I don't actually see that license in the back of this particular Call of Cthulhu book, but I do see Wizards of the Coast official logo on it. So that's interesting. Probably not terribly relevant to the discussion as far as the OGL goes, but interesting nonetheless. Building Persephone says, I can see if things go badly for Wizards of the Coast, D&D Beyond no longer supporting 5e content. Oh, if, if things go badly, right, if they, they're no longer supporting 5e content. Yeah, I could see that too. I could see that too. Because now D&D Beyond is owned by Wizards of the Coast. The authorization, uh, Bernard pa uh, Posset, Bernard, uh, Bernhard, uh, Bernhard says, the authorization is very likely to related, the authorization is very likely to be related to where it occurs in the text, section nine, updating the license. They exclude 1.A from the licenses that you can use. Okay, is that the 1.1? The Grimhild says, that would hurt. I own all the books on D&D Beyond and pay for a pro account to share to my group for my online campaign. I'm sure they'd offer an upgrade to one D&D content. I'm sure they would. Uh, if you didn't know, Wizards of the Coast owns D&D and bought them. Right, so if, if they're trying to push everybody over to... But then, see, but then again, we've got this issue with backward compatibility, right? Uh, but But on the other hand... Maybe you don't have access to anything in the fifth edition, just rule books now, that core book now. It's all the uh, sixth edition, one D&D core rule book. Uh, yes, then, right. So that's why uh, they might do that, right? I can totally see D&D Beyond uh, Wizard of the Coast doing that. Bernhardt says, there are other and better systems floating around. If this is one issue for you, you need to get over the sunken cost fallacy. Well, but see, okay, we got two, di but it depends on who you're talking about here. Because we were talking about the the impact on different groups of people. So if you're talking about a player, and we talked about this earlier, if you're talking about a player, 
like what kind of sunk costs do you have? Well, I mean, you might have the, the book investitures and things like that, but I mean, you can go over, I mean, you can keep playing it. You can play whatever you want. You can do homebrew stuff. You can go to another system. You can keep playing fifth edition. I mean, what type of impact does that have? Uh, people with much greater sunk costs are potentially publishers. Uh, Building Persephone says, shout out for the sunken cost fallacy. Hard truths being dropped here. And, but yeah, I mean, even if you're a publisher and you've, well, you know, I, I sunk um, thousands of dollars into preparing all of these books or having these books printed and stuff like that, because that's what I, but now it's time to move on. So who knows? Guitar Guy Nick says, there's an actual channel called The Rules Lawyer, who is a PF2 guy. He's actually a lawyer. I bet that he was the one, The Rules Lawyer, is the guy who was, oh, yeah, you're talking about, especially in relation to the rules lawyering. Uh, I, I have encountered the rules lawyer in the chat because when I was unboxing and uh, taking a look at Pathfinder uh, second edition for the first time, like two or three days ago, I was uh, opening up the Pathfinder second edition starter box and in the chat was the rules lawyer. I need to subscribe to his channel. Let me make note of that. Subscribe to the rules lawyer channel. He uh, had some great insight uh, into uh, rules. It's always nice when you've got somebody when we're looking at a new system and then in the chat, um, there's somebody who already is familiar with it and can add context or point me in different directions, things like that. When we're looking at a new system. And he was definitely doing that for uh, Pathfinder second edition uh, on that stream. And I really appreciate that. If you're thinking about getting into Pathfinder second edition, I do recommend you take a look at the morning grind live stream where we opened up that box. Then we was like, I believe that was like maybe been Monday or something like that. Wasn't all that long ago. And he was in the chat. Grimhild says, too much effort to rebuild everything in a different system to continue our current campaign, which is so far 600 hours, and double that for me behind the scenes building maps, tokens, uh, handouts, etc. Yeah, but, you know, that uh, people shouldn't worry about not playing their own game. Like, you know, some people will say, and I don't want to spend more money, and that's fine. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, if you're playing with your existing stuff and all of your homebrew stuff, I mean, unless you're trying to make some type of really serious statement, I mean, keep playing. Especially you're in the middle of a campaign and all that. Keep playing that. Bernhard says, yeah, never change system mid-campaign. Just go to something different after it, after your roof's up. Yeah, exactly. I agree. Or, you know, if, if you enjoy it or go to something new, try something new or keep playing it. 